Welcome everyone to this episode of the Women in Technology Spotlight. Today I'm here with Rashina Gajar. She is the creator of Amplify Studios. Hi, Rashina. Hi, Ranka. So, so happy to be here. So glad we could make it. Um, my first question is usually tell us a little bit about yourself, Rashina. So I would say that I'm a very international person. I have been an expat since I was six years old, so I've lived in many different countries. I speak French and Spanish as well as English. Um, I love reading. I love traveling, obviously. Um, I really like reading cheesy self-improvement books. <laughs> um, and I love meeting new people. Yeah, that's okay. Me. Thank you for that. That's a really interesting backstory. So you lived in how many different countries? You said six, I think. Yes, six. I would like to understand why you moved so much uh, in your life. Is this something you did as an adult or did you grow up? Uh, did your parents move a lot? What is the background story here? So my parents moved a lot. My father used to work for an American company in sales. So he was sent all around Europe and then to India and around Asia to open up sales offices for this. Actually, it was kind of like a technology company. And so when I was six years old, I was born in England. When I was six years old, I moved to India for a couple of years. Then I moved to France. Then I moved back to England. And then part of that was me carrying the torch and just having developed that itch for traveling and, and discovering the world. I then wasn't able to stay put for any longer. And so then I went and I lived in Ireland and I also lived in Spain and in Italy. Um, now I'm in Amsterdam. I'm not living in Amsterdam, but I'm just here. So, um, yeah, I kind of I think it was part the occupational hazard of my, my parents, but then also how that affected me as a very young person and what I then saw to be my world was a lot you know, a lot bigger, I guess, than most people. Um, what I would like to ask is, um, do you feel that this has made you a different person, you know, living in different cultures? What is your, what is the upside of living in different places? I mean, there is tremendous upside. I think that it gives you this insight into people and into societies and, and cultures and how things operate you see things from a very different vantage point compared to, let's say you grow up in one country and then the entire system in that country is orchestrated around, let's say you go to school, then you go to university, then you have to get a select number of degrees before you're deemed worthy enough to go into the world of work. And then the same thing starts again, right? But those systems are different for each country. And so, being part of so many different countries, seeing those systems at play, seeing how individuals are affected by all of the things that, I mean, all of the hoops that we think we have to jump through, for example, um, that gave me a very different view on people, on different countries, on, you know, the, the I guess, the, the way in which our culture shapes us. Mm -hmm. And also, I think, is where my passion for self-development came from because I really started to see that it is possible to overcome certain aspects of the culture that you were taught to adapt to. Mm -hmm. so that was something that came from that. I would also say just understanding the world and seeing things from, from afar in a way uh, is really valuable and especially in the the world that we live in today where everything is mixed up and people are working now remotely with people from all over the world it's it's just such a huge advantage to have that insight into the lives that the person across the screen for example mm -hmm. is living uh, mm -hmm. so that's what I would say is the the advantage you talked a little bit about the different educational systems. I mean, that is always an issue. If you move a lot as a child, you go through different educational systems. That can be a, an issue or it can be a good thing. I depend. So I would like to understand how your experience was uh, in terms of education. What did you go through? It was extremely mixed. So mm -hmm. I had um, my first ever school that I went to was a British school from like, you know, when I was six years old, I left that school. Then I went to a Canadian school. Then I went to a school with the US curriculum. And there was a brief period in between where I was being homeschooled by uh, a woman who had 
a, a beagle and a tortoise, like a huge tortoise. And I would be um, kind of sitting in, in her place with this giant tortoise being homeschooled. Um, and yeah, so those different systems. And then I also um, then went to a French school. So I had to do all of my learning in French. Then I switched into a British school where I had to do all of my learning in English. Mm -hmm. So that was very mixed, very um, like getting thrown in at the deep end continuously, I would say. Um, I've experienced so many different schooling systems. Uh, but I would say that what is really interesting about it is that you really are mixed in with lots of different people. And so you learn a lot about different cultures. You also see the types of lives that people lead. So for example, when I was at an international school, all of the, the young children that I was with were all expatriates. So they really immediately included me and made me feel welcome because they under they understood everything that I was going through. Also, I remember when I was at a French primary school at one point, they were like, who is this person? Why does she not speak French? You know, a lot of those kids had never really left the town that they lived in. So it's a very different dynamic. And that's where you start to understand how the cultures and societies that we're part of form our way of thinking from a very early stage. And then it's up to us to consciously kind of evolve that if we so choose. Yeah, that's an interesting point that you can, by, by switching around a lot, you can actually step outside of the situation you're in and, and have a view of, as an outsider and understand uh, certain things that um, people who remain in the same place and always have the same experience can't relate to. Um, normally, I ask people um, if the schools they went uh, through were technical schools, but in your case, I have to know more about the woman with the tortoise, obviously. So <laughs> homeschooling, <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> that was, so my parents have always been very resourceful. So I remember the Canadian school that I went to, there was a French teacher, for example, who was really, really good. And they asked him to teach us French at our home. And then there was another teacher who she actually left and stopped teaching at the school. And they asked her to be our homeschool tutor. So when I switched schools, I actually took that teacher with me and I went to her house and she, yeah, and, and she just kind of sat us down, me and my brother at the same time and taught us all about the Wright brothers and all kinds of really magical things, actually. And we were just sitting there in this, this big terrace with the, the giant tortoise. And to be honest, it was a very interesting experience. I think going from different schooling systems and then in the interim period being homeschooled, I don't think many people have the um I don't know if it's luck because it's kind of just very strange as an experience but I think it's nice to have those different versions when I was at school in Buckinghamshire one of the boys that joined the school had been homeschooled his entire life so it was an adjustment for him to go into a schooling system after being homeschooled for you know until he was 16 mm -hmm. but it was nice for me to have had that for a very small portion of time yeah. and not be socially maimed by it let's say mm -hmm. definitely I think um, it's more about the variation of experience than the individual experience I, and that is something that that is actually true for life it's not about um, the specific thing you're doing it's about the variety of things that you're open to doing I think yeah, yeah. Such an interesting uh, experience. And what I just learned is you have a brother, obviously. Is he younger yeah. or older? Yeah, he's a, a year and a half younger than me. But um, taking the education a step further, what did you do after you finished your, uh, not primary, but your basic education? Uh, what was, did you go to university? Did you, what did you do? So I went to the University of Bristol and I studied modern languages and then, um, I took a year abroad whilst I was at the University of Bristol and went to Luxembourg. I went to live in Luxembourg and then I went to live in uh, Seville in Spain. And whilst I was in Luxembourg, I did uh, an internship at a very large communications agency, which was really interesting. Um, I got to work with some really huge brands like Logitech, L'Occitane en Provence, Columbia Sportswear. So it was a really interesting professional grounding experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so you 
studied languages, which makes sense since you already had this basis in different languages. And actually something I wanted to say, um, I would have thought you were British, just there is no accent. And I assume you speak French as well yeah. without an accent, which is really interesting. So cool to be able to do that. Um, and uh, the next thing I, I wanted to ask is, so since you studied languages, um, I would be interested in what your journey was into becoming the creator of Amplified Studios and what your company now actually does. Can you share that story with us? Of course. So it's, it's an interesting story because it was very much an exploration and a lot of experimentation, to be honest. So Amplify Studio is a creative studio. We work with technology companies and we work on very highly targeted creative campaigns, brand building initiatives um, that really resonate and are meaningful to their target audience. And the reason that that came about is an interesting story. And I think it's very closely linked actually with the Mware. Um, so what happened was I, when I left university, I actually was recruited as part of VMware's graduate scheme in 2016. And um, so I ended up working in sales, being trained up by VMware to work as you know, a salesperson having her own region. And I was running a small region in the south of France, actually, as an inside sales executive, which was funny because I had never, you know, some of these concepts like what is a virtual machine I hadn't even heard of before a year, a year before starting at VMware. And then all of a sudden I was training, training to actually sell these kinds of things um, to IT directors in, in the south of France. So it was very interesting talking to people about their licensing in a different language. Um, and it was ironic because the, the region that I had was actually the region I used to live in, in the south of France. So I was, all of a sudden I would see a name of some, some city that was part of my region and I would be like, yes, amazing, <laughs> because it was somewhere that I had actually been to. So it was actually very poetic that it happened in that way. Um, and what I noticed though was a lot of the marketing initiatives and activities felt kind of disconnected from what I could actually present to my clients. So I started to really get to know my clients very well. I would engage in very lengthy conversations with them at times. And I started to see there was a bit of a disconnect between technology and corporate marketing um, kind of from an organizational level. And then what actually does the client want and what does the salesperson want for the client because they have that relationship and that mutual understanding. And so that sort of started me thinking about a couple of things. Um, and then I went on to work with this other technology company and I just kind of went in and fixed a bunch of problems in their business. And they had been, when I first started working with them, they had been stagnating at 500K a month for two years. And so then I went in and I moved them up to their first $1 million a month within four months. And that was the point at which I said, okay, I have to stop working for myself because it's crazy to be doing this for someone else's business. So I started working for myself and I really went back to a lot of my creative roots. So how can I do something that adds value to a business, to their bottom line, to the, the pipeline that they're able to generate, but at the same time really connects with their audience and their customers and is meaningful to them and memorable and is grounded in the important issues of today, right? Not just, um, okay, do you want to buy this thing that we're selling that we've developed a new version of and it's really exciting because X, Y, Z. So I started to draw upon a lot of those early experiences in the world of IT. And now the companies that we work with are all technology companies and and that is, in a way, our competitive advantage is that very deep, immersive understanding that we have of the world of technology. So in a way, that laid the path for you know, the, the starting of my career and now what I'm doing today. I'm very, very grateful for it. And it came as a total surprise, to be honest. So that's what we do. I think that's an interesting segue from languages to um, now selling technology or marketing technology. But on a different level, it makes total sense because um, a lot of our job in technology is around communication. And what I heard from what you said is that you are very good at understanding people's needs from what they communicate, while other people would just think about, oh, I can I sell them X, Y, Z. You obviously have the gift of listening to the customer's pain mm -hmm. and need and creating a solution. So I love that basically what you did was 
immediately understand that you need to sell solutions, not products. And I think that is also the foundation of your result, I guess. So. Yes, that's a really important point. And it's something that, so I have a small team now and I invested a tremendous amount of time in training them. And one of the things that I talk about in my training, which no one would ever think to link that with brand building, copywriting, marketing. I talk about translation and I talk about the modules that I studied when I was at university around translation and around the different forms of translating. So translating for cultural understanding, translating for meaning. And I think this is very, very similar to what you're saying is that it's all about the meaning and the understanding and the communication. It's not about what you're actually selling. It's about that bridge between two people and the value that is attributed to let's say I want to buy something from you. Why is that meaningful to me? Why does that change my life? It's not about the thing that you're handing me. It's about the wider significance of that thing. And I think that that's something I came across initially when I was working at VMware and value selling. And um, it's something I apply every day. And I, I, I think it is very much the communication side of language that became relevant through that work. Yeah. That's such, um, such an important topic, I feel, communication. I recently wrote an article on Medium about exactly this, that I feel that the most important skill in technology nowadays is communication and not um, you know, the specific technical skill. Because even if you're a programmer or a developer, even if you sit most of your time coding, you will need to be able to communicate efficiently with others and understand their needs, or you will not be able to work in technology today. So. Yeah, kudos. And, and it's really interesting that you talked about translation, you know, and the, I never think about this, even though um, I read a lot of translated books and, and, and watch translated movies. But um, of course, there's a, there, there is a need to understand the culture when you are translating. So there is because it's not just words. Words have completely have no meaning per se. It's a, it's a context and a culture that gives your communication meaning. It's yeah. such an amazing uh, side aspect I've never even t thought about. Yeah. So thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. And for example, at the moment, I'm reading this book, which I don't think is very easy to get hold of, but it's, it's um, The Way of Life. And it's actually a, a recent translation, but it's they had to translate it from Mandarin. And the thing that is really interesting about it is even at the beginning, they talk about how difficult it is to translate this and how so many past variants of the translations of the book have been insufficient. And so every translator has taken their turn at going about that. And I thought that was interesting because that's kind of the endless pursuit of a translator is to very much kind of accurately represent that meaning in a different in a different world and language. Yeah. Um, another aspect of what you have been telling me is the fact that you went from being employed to being an entrepreneur and now you're also the boss of uh, an entire team. So how how is this transition for you? How, how did you manage that? Because it's a lot of responsibility all of a sudden. It's not just about you. And, and um, how, how did that go? <laughs> Honestly, it, it has been a huge learning curve, absolutely huge. I mean, the one thing that I think has helped me over the years is I remember when I was at university, I ran, I created this digital magazine of my own and I had like a bunch of interns who were double my age. Like <laughs> some of them were married and had kids, you know, so that was interesting. And I think that at least taught me, I guess, in my own naive way at the time, um, that I could manage people and that it wasn't something that, you know, required so much effort, um, at least for me at the time, I kind of really learned that I was very natural at it. Um, I think the transition from being, for example, working for VMware, then working for a different technology company, um, to then working for myself and then hiring a team was more difficult because what I would say is, working for yourself firstly there's a big transition that happens between working for a company and working for yourself and I would say it takes a couple of years to find your feet in that right so to develop the relationships for people to learn about what you're doing to know how they can refer you there are lots of different steps that you have to go through even mentally 
going into the mindset of an entrepreneur. There are lots of different phases you have to go through. And I see that some of the people that are in my network are younger than me and they're, they've just left that job and they're starting to work for themselves. So I see those same phases in them and I try to give them guidance because I remember what that was like for me. And I would say that is the first phase. Then the second phase is when you go from working for, for yourself and doing everything yourself to then having a team. That's another step because all of a sudden you are thinking about salaries, you're thinking about responsibilities, you're starting to do things that you wouldn't necessarily, usually, for example, I would do everything myself. So then giving things, delegating things becomes more of a challenge when it's your unique livelihood. Whereas before, if you're working in a company, it doesn't really matter as much. You know you're going to get a salary or a commission at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. So going through that phase was very different and very eye-opening in many ways because I had to start thinking as the CEO of this company, I have all of these beautiful client relationships I'm very grateful for. But then it was also training the team, making them comfortable, creating a psychologically safe space for them to be able to actually try new things and be proactive and, and feel that there's someone who's going to catch them. And at that point, what I found very helpful was looking back to the experience that I had when I worked at that French digital communications agency and part of the experience that I had when I was at VMware, because I find that French culture is very good at taking care and nurturing employees and just giving them that safety. And that's what I found. I remember when I worked at VMware, my field guy, he was French and he always had my back. Mm -hmm. And the same with the agency that I worked with in Luxembourg. They were very good at training me up, mentoring me, giving me the input, the encouragement, showing me that I could do things. And they would never point the finger at me if something happened, they would always make it a safe place where it was, this is a learning curve, it's completely normal. And that's maybe the French, the issue that they have is all these overqualified candidates looking for jobs, right? That's a completely different issue. But I would say that they're exceptional when it comes to training and development and creating that safety. And so that's something that I then drew from at that phase in my transition. But it was rocky and it's never... I think the biggest thing is when you work in a company and you become very good at what you do, it's then more challenging to see yourself taking risks and not being on top of everything. Yeah. So then you get used to being good at what you do. You can't be good at what you do as an entrepreneur without trying a bunch of stuff and failing mm -hmm. and then learning from that and picking yourself up. So that's, where it becomes tricky if you really take yourself seriously and as in your role as a as a kind of a corporate person let's say mm -hmm. uh interesting because the first thing i would think about when thinking of going um out on your own would be uh the responsibility that you have towards your um, employees but there's all these other issues that you just uh, mentioned that i never even thought about it's the letting go of control because uh, when you're alone, you can actually control every aspect of, of the product you're delivering. But then you have to trust. So there's the trust. There's the letting go of control. There's, of course, and, and that's a very important part that you talked about is the creating the safe space for people to work, which is something. And that's an also awesome, a very uh, interesting point. I just read recently that women are better leaders um, of teams. And that is one of the reasons because they're better at doing that, you know, giving other people a safe space uh, to actually try out things and that's why teams led by women are statistically more uh, successful so I, I feel you're very very reflected and I, I, I'm actually um, very very impressed of how much thought you have put into all these things because most people I feel always just you know like stumble along and then there's some end product but I, I, you're really really self-reflected which is great and I think that your employees are um, <clears throat> profiting of the, all these thoughts you have put into your, your company um, and you already talked about something about mentoring, about seeing young people who are a few years behind you and giving them your insights and helping them along. So if you meet a young person who is starting out um, in this field and, and trying to find a football hold a young woman going into maybe a career in a space like yours, what would you recommend? 
I know this is a difficult and loaded question because you have this really magnificent and diverse background, but what would you recommend? Okay, let's see. So the first thing, I'm going to speak to a couple of different experiences because my team, me and my team, we actually also mentor young creative women. So that's like a separate thing. But what I would say is if you're going into a company, I think the first thing is to really not be afraid to be proactive, to hold your own, to ask questions, to reach out to people and ask for help. I think that the challenge that can come up with that is that some companies, while they want diversity and inclusion and they recognize that the outer world, all of the candidates that are currently the most promising candidates on the market, they expect that, they expect that fast track and the ability to rise at that own merit. A lot of companies aren't culturally equipped to deal with that. So I think learning the politics of how organizations work and being conscious of that while at the same time exercising courage and proactivity and audacity to a degree is important. I would say it's never easy to just jump into the, the great unknown, right? Everyone, especially me, suffers from that. It's, it's always daunting and kind of scary, but just knowing that you can actually make a difference just with yourself, I think is a really important thing to arm yourself with just that knowledge and to try and be kind to yourself through the process. I also would say not letting other people's limitations cloud your judgment. I have for many years let that happen. And, you know, it, it sometimes really gets in the way of you kind of actually exercising and seeing your own glory, right? The, the beauty of your own understanding, perception, skills. So I think, especially when it comes to the technology industry, which is very heavily male dominated, young women need to go in there knowing their worth and exercising their worth and not letting any external factors that either represent an affirmation, a confirmation of what they think is lacking in themselves or edge them on actually affect what they think of themselves. Mm -hmm. So whether the world is responding well or not is not an indicator of whether you're on the right path. Just, you know, trust. And I would say also having good people to help you, especially in those initial years, because it can be very complicated to enter into a whole mini universe, which is what corporations are, right? They, they're their own machine um, without understanding how it works. And sometimes other people can help you with that. So um, yeah, that's what I would say. And I think when it comes to, you know, not working for a company um, and working on your, your own or being a founder of a company that's um, in the technology industry, that's also very challenging, to be honest. Um, but again, what I, what I would say, especially in that case, is having the right people on site is so important. Surrounding yourself, curating the people that you actually spend time with. Because when we grow up, and this comes back to my background, right, having lived in all these different countries, when we grow up, we tend to accrue friendships and relationships based on our surroundings because we spend a lot of time with those people. So at school or at university or then in the workplace, you just kind of hang out with people. Um, but many people find themselves in friendship groups that actually aren't supportive, where even their female friends, if they saw them having something good in their life, wouldn't be genuinely happy for them. So it's important to just be intentional about who you keep in your life, especially if you're in business for yourself, but if you're working in a corporation as well, because that will dictate the standards that you hold them, hold yourself to, and also the direction in which you can progress and how much you let yourself progress. So I know that was a bit of a speech. No, that's perfect. And especially the last point is uh, something that I find you can't emphasize enough, the need to have a strong network and to find your tribe, basically, because, um, yeah, you have 
and and it's so true you grow up you make connections and they just stay with you and you don't reevaluate the reason why you are in a friendship with people and and a lot of people will drag you down they will be skeptical they don't take risks themselves so they want to stop you from taking risks and and this is this is a thing finding people who understand your dreams and your goals and and will cheer you on is a very big thing i think for for young people who want to reach uh, some some destination some time in their life yeah yes yeah. thank you for talking about that it's actually a really big point here Okay, so we have actually reached the uh, um, end of our half hour already, which flew by. It's always such a short time in, in hindsight that I have with, with uh, you. Um, is there anything else you would want to share before we end this session? Is there anything? I think especially within the context of the technology space, you know, most technology brands are kind of commoditized at the moment. Everything has changed so much that everything is, you know, anything that you really see online is, is technology based, right? So I think it's more and more important for us to use that with intention, to be intentional about how we navigate that world, um, not letting it use you, but rather leveraging it for your own purposes. I think that's important. And I think that it's important for any young person who's going into the world of technology to really get to know themselves, understand and acknowledge their own worth and to pull in the right people to help them on that journey and not get um, you know, sucked into the titles, but more so the actual people behind them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, thank you for that as well. Very true. My pleasure. So oh, thank you, Roshina. It was wonderful having you. Um, I hope to talk to you soon. And um, yeah, thank you for your time. Likewise, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really love this chat. <laughs>